Oh, we're okay. We're recording. Now I see where it is. Well, welcome to Practically Tactical, the show where we add critical thinking to your everyday carry. On tonight's show, we have my very good friend, my very dear friend, my travel partner to the, what I vacation, uh, how I vacation, which is a, a shooting class, Annette Evans. So, hey, hi. everyone. Hi, Annette. And Scott Phillips is on as a uh, Patreon supporter guest person, uh, because I think that he likes when I call him Fedora. Um, so we want to thank our amazing uh, Patreon supporters who help us do our shows and help turn gun owners into responsibly armed citizens. We can't thank you guys enough. If you like our shows and our content, please check us out on our website or visit patreon.com forward slash practically tactical. We also want to thank our amazing sponsors, uh, Big Tech's Outdoors, Shot Stop Ballistics, and Phoenix Ammo. So please visit practicallytactical.com for more information on sponsors for links and for discount codes. You can save money and get good stuff, and that's nice. Um, <laughs> while you're checking out the show notes, please be sure to do all your Amazon shopping with our Amazon affiliate link by clicking on the Amazon banner at practicallytactical.com. Uh, so on this episode, uh, you'll notice that I'm not Nick. Uh, I think I'm, I have way better hair, I'm way prettier. Um, Jesse is not here either because they are on the road, they're going to some place in Michigan to take a pistol class or something. I don't know. A half lesson well, to talk. I think they're kind of avoiding me because last time I was on the show, I don't think they were on either. Wow. Sounds like a bit of, sounds like a bit of racism to me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll just have to come back on more. I guess so. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Annette. Um, on this show, I'm super excited because we are talking shotgun. Ooh. And this is an AAR, an after action report on a class that Annette and I both went to. Uh, fancy that. Although we didn't take a nightstand gun picture, so I kind of. Uh, it was just like every time we wanted to, we we're like, oh, we need to go into that because we had like a two room suite thing. I was like, well, there's some guns in there we need to put on too. Oh, well, Matt Hot, Matt Hot was also in the class and staying with us. And we we're like, well, we should wait for Matt because he'll put his guns in. And then we were just like, you know what? It just never happened. It would have been 80 guns on it. <laughs> I'm not sure we would have fit them anywhere, but yeah. like some large part, portion of floor because we all brought multiple shotguns, I think. Uh, I was thinking that it didn't. Real, yeah, and I had an extra rifle somehow. And then I, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a, as one does. And then, uh -huh. you know, like, everyone's got at least one pistol, maybe two, maybe three, and yeah, yeah it was a little crazy. I, I was uh, really excited because I only brought one shotgun, one pistol for use in the class, and then the SIG uh, 226 SAO, which I'm, it's on loan from my friend. Uh, you may know her, Annette Evans. <laughs> Never heard of her. Never heard of her. <laughs> don't like her, but I don't like her. Um, and uh, but I brought that for a very specific purpose, which you'll actually hear here in a second. Um, so the, the class was Shotgun Three Hundred and Sixty, and it was um, uh, done by Ashton Ray and his company, Three Hundred and Sixty Performance Shooting. Um, and Tim Chandler was also uh, part of this. Tim Chandler has his own company, which is Justified Force Con Justified Force Concepts. Right? Justified Defensive Training. I always I was I, I didn't write it down in my AR. Uh, but yeah, justified defensive training. Um, and the way that I got in to, well, you know what, Annette, let's have you introduce yourself just for those who haven't seen a prior show. Because all of these do become public, all the AAR, so that people can see like, oh, you know, this is a good class and stuff. So not just our Patreon viewers will see it. So uh, Annette, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. So Annette Evans, some people know me as the beauty behind the blast. And I... Um, I own Race Street Range in Philadelphia, where I host a lot of training. So part of that, and as part of things that I'm interested in too, I train a lot and I shoot a lot. I come from a competition training background. I've been doing a lot of defensive shooting. I shoot pretty much everything and I take classes from pretty much everyone that I can get to stream with. Oh, and I'm a girl. And she's a girl. So I like how there was a long pause. Yes. 
Well, there, there is a different perspective, I think, and especially in a class like this one, that's something that came up as, um, for the first time in a shooting class, I felt like I was at a disadvantage because of my size and mm. my gender. Mm, yeah, shotguns can move you around, although you had one of the lowest uh, uh, time times for uh, the casino drill. You were like 45 seconds. Because I think I had the lowest raw time. I had more misses because I didn't know where the optic was hitting, but I think I had the lowest raw time on there. So. Yeah, yeah. So, and you were doing, uh, you were loading doubles, but uh, yes. we'll get into that stuff here in a second. So the instructors were Ashton Ray and, uh, and Tim Chandler, and the class took place on August 3rd and 4th uh, at uh, 20, 2019 at a private range in Virginia. Uh, Pennsylvania. We were in Pennsylvania. Oh, right. It was my Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah. It was a trip before that that we went to Pennsylvania. Yeah. We're, we, we're, we're like always on the road with each other, so I don't know where the hell we are. Anymore. And I'm always driving and you're always sleeping. Correct. I could take you anywhere. You wouldn't know. That's also true. That's why I didn't know. I'm going to blame it on that. I had no idea where we were because I was just asleep on the ride. Um, so, um, so how I got into this class was I met Tim, uh, Tim Chandler, when I was in a John Murphy of FPS, ah, when we were both in a John Murphy of FPS <laughs> trainings, uh, concealed carry advanced skills and tactics class. And um, my buddy, Matt Harris, or our buddy, Matt Harris, had, had cued me into that Tim was like a shotgun dude. And I was like, huh, okay. So I started talking shotguns with, with Tim, you know, in, during the breaks when we're jamming mags and stuff like that. And Shotgun 360 came up and I was like, dude, I need, I need to get into that class. And I knew that you were going, um, and I knew that Matt, I then found out that Matt Hot was going, I was like, oh, this is really exciting. And so- I got I, even more exciting when we found out Rob Hot was going. Yes, I actually have a, a, like a, a list of the people in this class. It was pretty star-studded, which was really cool. And so basically, I worked out a deal uh, to get into the class to perform to do some media. So, uh, so I was I was auditing the class, um, and it was uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. And that's the end of the show. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but basically, we had just just in this class, we had let's see, Matt Hot, Rob Hot his father, who was like the shotgun dude, uh, Eric Stern from Beretta, Tom Kelly of Dark Star Gear, John Johnson of Ballistic Radio, and Chris Baker of Lucky Gunner, and then you and I. So it was like, it was like a fun class, you know? I mean, and these are all people that like, you know, can run shotguns and, and we were just gonna, you know, have, have a bunch of fun doing it. Uh, so that was pretty cool, but, um, I guess the the first thing I want to talk about, and then I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to you, is the class before the class. So once once I kind of uh, arranged to, to audit the class, I was I was talking to uh, Ashton a bunch online, and he was so giving with information that at one point, you know, and I, I like I didn't want to show up to the class. I hadn't taken a shotgun class in over a decade. That's how long it had been. Because nobody nobody takes shotgun classes, and and if they do they're kind of rare and hard to come by, you know, everybody takes pistol classes followed by rifle or whatever, you know, depending on what their, what their, um, pro the priorities are. But I was like, shit, you know, like, for example, all my shot cards literally from, I don't know, 2009 or 10 where the elastic was gone. Like they didn't even retain the shell. So I had to get new shot cards. So I was bouncing questions back and forth with, with Ashton. And at one point I actually apologized. I'm like, sorry, dude, for like all the questions. You know what he said? He said, dude, it's cool. I like shotguns and I like talking about them. <laughs> and the reason that I say that was because one, it was cool that he went out of his way to kind of like give me information. You know what I mean? But two, that kind of was the kind of almost the, the vibe of the class. You know, you could tell that they really liked the subject matter, they really liked sh shotguns themselves, and they really in liked informing others and teaching others about the guns. What do you think about that? I think that's really true. This was definitely a, a, almost a, um, an ode to the shotgun, I think. Because one of the things about Shotgun 360 is that it's a class to show you things that are possible with a shotgun that you might not know are possible with a shotgun. 
So I think a lot of us have this idea that shotguns are something that I shoot clays with, something that I hunt with, maybe I shoot three gun with it, maybe I do home defense with it. And I have a very you know, set idea of what works and what doesn't work. And this class was all about exploring the margins of that and exploring things that you might not know to even try with a shotgun or the details of why it works the way, it, why, why they work the way that they do. And that's really the only, only the kind of class that comes out of extreme nerdery, right? Th this is a class that comes from shotgun nerds. It's probably most appreciated by shotgun nerds or shooting nerds, people who just want to know the details. And by knowing the details, you learn how to run the weapon way better. Mm. Yeah, they are definitely shotgun nerds. Uh, in fact- And that's a compliment. Uh, yeah, it's a compliment because uh, not enough people, I think, are nerdy about shotguns. In fact, if there's one misunderstood weapon, it's probably shotguns, followed by revolvers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but revolvers, it's kind of like simple what people kind of don't understand. Like you can correct that more easily than shotguns. Shotguns are kind of like every – they kind of fall into the category of every man's gun but a master's weapon. You know. They're interesting because shotguns and revolvers both get, uh, they both get recommended a lot to people who don't shoot, right? Like, oh, look at how easy this is. But then when we really start digging into it, they're both really hard to shoot well. Mm. Yeah, and with shotguns, it's, it's kind of even more challenging because there's more areas of potential failure by, from lack of knowledge, from just sheer ignorance. For example, load selection. Um, I actually, I learned so much in this class and I like, you know, I'm not a, um, a big super new gear type dude, but I keep relatively informed about, you know, various different uh, ammunition types and stuff like that, because you kind of have to, like if something new and better comes along, it's like, yeah, I'd rather carry that. I want the most effective thing to stop this person from doing the things that they're doing right this second. Um, mm -hmm. And like one of the things that can just absolutely screw someone, regardless of how much they spend on a shotgun is just what they're running through it. And I'm not talking about brat, you know, steel case wolf, which is really actually pretty far from most things like, you know, training and shit, but you know, knowing really how your gun patterns, knowing if it will cycle in your semi-automatic, knowing, um, you know, really being, really power stroking a four end if you're running a, a slide action shotgun. These are things that are, are kind of just laden with potential failure points, you know, where, whereas we look at it like, oh yeah, just get an H&R partner, get loaded up with buckshot and you're good to go. Well, yes, but kind of no. You know, right. um, and also, you know, shotguns are one of the highest recoiling weapons that we shoot regularly here in the U.S. You know, like the safari rifle isn't really a thing for most people, but the 12 gauge shotgun is super common. And, you know, there's a lot you can get away with when you're the average man. But remember, we hand these to a lot of children. We hand these to a lot of small statured women. And we have all seen the YouTube videos of some dude, hi Tina, some dude hang, handing a shotgun to a completely unprepared person mm. and watching them completely lose, lose control of a gun, getting hit in the face, all this other stuff. So there's a lot of potential failure points with the shotgun. Yeah, and I'm sure that we'll talk more about load selection and stuff like this, but uh, you know, one of the things that was drilled in and uh, was done early in the class, which which one of the things that we especially look at as instructors, both Annette and I, is what are the points of instruction? What are the order? What is the order of those points of instruction? Because if you learn the thing that you needed the entire class at the end of day two, that sucks. And I've actually been in classes like that where I'm like, you're teaching grip on the middle of day two? What the fuck is wrong with you? Like, that's mm -hmm. not the way that people learn. And, you know, so now you got all these people with like 700 rounds of poor reps, you know what I mean, with the pistol class. But one of the things that was absolutely stressed was a, the, what's called the push-pull method, uh, um, where you push forward on the forend as you pull back in the buttstock in your, in your shoulder, uh, and it, it allows you to really mitigate muzzle rise and recoil. Um, if you go to my Instagram, 
if it's still there because Instagram is cutting off all sorts of gun people that are actually just regular firearms companies and stuff like that, uh, including agency arms and uh, well-armed woman. She just got cut or they just got cut. I don't know if you saw that. Um, there's me doing a casino drill with very, very, very hot um, 1,610 feet per second maximum yeah. loaded slugs. We felt them all across the range, thanks. What's that? We felt you shooting them all across the range. Oh, they were like fireballs. And, you know, uh, there were some rounds, you know, there were, there were some shots that I had. I was only down one point, so I missed one outside of the little, the, the, uh, the scoring zone. Uh, or zones because with multiple targets on your target, um, and uh, but like the, the the mitigation that you can achieve using that technique, and this is with a way too long of a stock Benelli, um, it's it's pretty pretty awesome. And that technique can be credited to actually apparently to Rob Hot. That's what that's what that's what Tim and, and Ash were saying. Mm -hmm. um, but so like they wanted us to get as many repetitions on using proper shooting technique as possible because this is not a, this is not a five, five, six, you right. know, this is, you know, if you want to get back on your sights and get that, that, that gauge back on the potential target as it may be, if it's not into a million pieces at this point, you know, uh, you gotta, you got to have good recoil compensation. If you're tracking targets, et cetera. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. I can't imagine anyone saying like, Oh, it's better to have less control of your gun, you know, I don't, I don't hear that very frequently. So thoughts on, thoughts on the, the push-pull technique and kind of how they reinforce that throughout the entire class. So push-pull is a super powerful technique. I also have video of the casino drill performed yeah. with slug. I was using reduced recoil slug, but I'm uh, quite a bit smaller than everybody else in the class. So, you know, I'll take that. Um, push-pull tech. I actually learned that technique from Rob last year. So I was really fortunate to do that, but I haven't shot a shotgun in almost a year when I showed up at this class. So when Tim and Ash started day one, almost round one with this is how you do it, it was a great review for somebody like me who just hasn't shot a whole lot of shotgun recently, who knew the technique sort of, but needed to get it, get back in the groove of it because it doesn't feel very natural if it's not how you learn how to shoot a shotgun. And then for our people like you who hadn't seen it before, it was enough to get them going on it. And it became really key to understand push-pull because there's other techniques that we did in the past that would not work at all if you weren't using push-pull underlying some of the different things they had you try. Mm. So when I'm shooting on the opposite side, when I'm shooting short stock, and I'm sure we'll talk about all those things work better with push-pull. So the fact that they started with that was really nice. Plus they gave a great warm-up, you know, like, we all say, hey, I'm going to get ready for this class. Maybe I'll go shoot before, make sure everything works, get some rounds down range. And I don't know about you, I never really get a chance to do that. So kind of easing into the class with, hey, remember how your shotgun works. Remember, you know, give you an opportunity to re-familiarize yourself with a gun that you know. Like, it's not a place to learn how to shoot your gun but it's a place to remind yourself how to shoot the gun so that the rest of the class flows much more smoothly. Yeah, definitely. And I'd actually been exposed and learned it uh, through a conversation with Steve Fisher uh, several years ago. But having that be the first thing that we're doing is, is super important, you know what I mean? So that way you're just not making smoke and noises and, and you know, hitting okay, because you know, if you have to shoot multiple times, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, <laughs> So, I also liked it because, you know, in beginner classes, basic classes, we know to do that as instructors, and we see that very often. When you get these more advanced classes, a lot of people forget that we need to go back to those fundamentals, make sure everyone's grooved in and everyone is on the same page and doing that before we get into the more complicated stuff. Yeah. Um, so now one of the questions that I think a lot of people will have because uh, we're big proponents of, of rifles for defensive situations is why the shotgun and Tim and Ash both made very valid, strong points about this is that essentially this is the most powerful thing that we can hold in our hands. Right. Mm -hmm. And that if we look at how many rounds may be necessary to really quote unquote neutralize a threat or to put someone down and out of the fight 
we're looking at maybe five or six rounds of nine millimeter, right? Or mm -hmm. pistol, right? We're looking at maybe three or four rounds of rifle. But we're looking at one well-placed shotgun round, you know, one well-placed double aught, eight or nine pellet flight control is going to drop them right where they stand. Uh, you know, again, shot placement being of paramount importance, but then again, you also have to aim a shotgun. I'm not going to go down that fucking line of thinking that you don't have to because, that, you know, you, you do. Um, but one of the cool things is you only have to aim it once. Yeah. So we talk about, you know, the five or six rounds or the three or four rounds you're going to need in another caliber and another gun, but you have to aim each one of them and land them where they need to go. Mm. With a yeah. good quality flight control that your gun likes, well, they're all going to, once you aim once, they're all going to hit right around where they need to go. Yeah. And it's a, it's like a different mechanism of injury with the way that this, these, these pellets are going in all these different directions and creating massive wound cavities. Uh, oh. And hitting all at once. Yeah, and hitting all at once. So pretty pretty horrendous thing. But, you know, if that person needs to be stopped right then, this is a very, still a very, very valid uh, weapons platform, you know. Um, it's also something that's available to people in pretty much every state. Yeah, true. It's, it's economical. You can get a pump shotgun that's going to be reasonably reliable for not a lot of money. And you can get it in even some of the banned states and things like that. It's still possible to get a shotgun where you might not be able to get an evil black rifle, where you might not be able to get a handgun. So that's another reason that we should be open to using that as a defensive weapon. Yeah. And now that I have a light on my Benelli, this is my home defense shotgun. This is my home defense uh, weapon, you know, nice. and uh, the, the gun, the Benelli ran great, although I did have to, there was, I, I was getting hiccups at, uh, actually at, at a police qual that you and I were, at, that you and I were at again, Jesus Christ. So, we do spend a lot of time together, don't we? You're stopping, you're stopping, you're stopping. <laughs> we're actually, we're actually a couple, I'm not gay. <laughs> whatever, whatever, this is how the internet knows. But um, yeah, and I was having these, these, these failures to chamber around and I realized finally, uh, that what was happening was the nose of the, the front of the shell was hitting the beginning of the chamber from the barrel extension in my Benelli. And it was just too hard of an edge. And so I got in there, I did some magic, you know, gunsmithing, <coughs> dremeling, and, uh, and it fixed it. So it ran great. I had one failure for the, uh, and I really don't know what exactly happened, but one failure uh, out, of, out of my Benelli, I'm on Super 90 in probably nearly 400 rounds. I would say something like that because I have, because this is one of the things I wrote down. We shot about, I would say around 250 rounds of birdshot, right? Or maybe even a little bit more, like three, maybe 300 rounds of birdshot, 50 rounds of buckshot, and about 25 slugs. Because we didn't shoot a whole ton of slugs. We shot a couple of changeover drills and we shot then the casino drill. But so it was a, it was a, it was a pretty hearty amount of shells. Um, however, there was, a very good reason why we fired every single one of them. Yes. So why don't, why don't you talk a little bit about that? And well, even, I guess I should prep this with saying, because my opinion as, as a learner, as a student, as an instructor, I'm big on why, really big on why. I mean, there's obviously there's a time and place where if you're in the middle of a drill, you know, and somebody says, just do it this way and you have to finish the drill and then they explain it. That's one thing, you know, that's a totally acceptable form of teaching. However, you find out at some point, you find out at some point you have, and you, and, but you have to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In my opinion. Right. Uh, and they were so good, such phenomenal instructors. They were some of the most phenomenal instructors that I'd never trained with. It was one of those kinds of things like why, how the fuck am I now getting in this class? you know, and I haven't been before, uh, but they knew the why behind this and they were able to explain it. And the mark of a good instructor is not how much they know and not how much they shoot. It's how they communicate the techniques to the student. Mm -hmm. That is the mark. And then, and then get them to do it, you know, uh, right. because at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding, right? Absolutely. They think that, you know, we were talking about making every round count. Yes, it was a high round count class, especially for shotgun. You know, that's a lot of rounds of shotgun to shoot in two days. 
And what I appreciated is we learned a lot of different techniques and different things over the course of two days. It was an extremely fast paced class with a lot of material, but we got reps in. Yeah. So either we were doing something to learn this new technique or we were getting in enough reps to understand what it was. We might not be able to master it and that's okay because this isn't the kind of class you go to to master a specific one individual skill, you know, like shooting a flying clay pigeon or something. This is a class where you learn what a shotgun is capable of and what things that you need to explore further on your own. Or you did enough reps so that you could do that later on. Yes. And, and going back to the why, I really believe that when I'm running the shotgun in, in practice sessions, because uh, I did some more... I did more modifications to my Benelli. So I was like, I got to make sure it, it runs. And I also wanted to make sure that it runs now with the light on it because, you know, things can be finicky and it does 100% all good. But I believe that because the why was so thoroughly addressed and said in such a manner that was relatable and, and simple, you know, I don't need big fucking words. Like I want simple. I want simple and just show me how to do it. Explain it to me simply because I'm not that bright. And let me do it, you know? And for example, there was a block on one-handed reloading that they literally came up apparently, uh, Ashton and, uh, and Tim, in the, while they were like talking late at night in their basements or something about how, how, what's a better way to reload the gun one-handed? I'm not going to tell you, you have to take the class, but that right there was an eye-opener. And the cool thing about many of, oh, would I say many? I would say some of the techniques is that you can make amendments to them to make them work for you. Uh, they lend themselves to that. So it's not like, oh shit, well, you know, if I can't do that, then this is worthless, you know, like. It was a very principles-based approach. Yes, exactly. And because it was principles-based and because it was, there was a thorough understanding of this is why we're teaching this technique the way that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. and that might require, you know, understanding and explaining why some traditional technique or some alternate technique isn't what they're doing, that you can take that thing and make it your own. Like that one handed reloading thing is I frankly have trouble holding up a shotgun one handed. Like that's just going to be a thing, you know, I'm five, four and you know, what, like 135. So there's only so much I can do when a shotgun weighs, you know, 10% of my body weight or whatever it is. But they were able to explain, well, we're holding it this way because this. Here's a way to make it give you more leverage if for whatever reason you're smaller, you're weaker, you're injured, mm -hmm. right? And then you could kind of play with it and look at like how your hands are moving and where you're tucking things and everything else and make it work for you. I was able to do every single one of those manipulations, just like everyone else in the class in that they got done, but not like everyone else in the class because they were all bigger than me and stronger mm -hmm. than me. Yeah. And I mean, I made little, little changes or addendums to what they were teaching kind of on the fly because I just thought that for my body and the way that I, can do things mm -hmm. it was it was like you know what i have a little bit more control if i do this but then they would come by and be like hey so pull it back underneath your arm further and i'm like oh shit big difference you know what i mean so so it was really cool it was very much um there were there were elements of this class that became almost laboratory like because these are big heavy weird to reload weapons this is not put the thing in the thing and pull the thing this is like, turn it over, right? You know, put the, <laughs> press the thing. It's like 45 steps to, you know, reload the thing. So it was very cool because they were, they were, you could tell that they were absolutely, both the, both the instructors absolutely comfortable in working with each student through things, you know? Yeah, they so did a great job like, of that with me. Because, you know, when you have to shoot five rounds as fast as you can pull the trigger with a shotgun, it's a lot of work. Even with push-pull, that is a lot of recoil. So they worked with me and they were um, really gentle with me in a night, you know, in not a condescending way, 
of, hey, look, that's really hard for you. Let's do this. Or, you know what, I'm going to stand behind you and make sure you don't fall over because we're just, we're going to shoot the tube out of your shotgun. You know, every round in there as fast as you can pull the trigger. Mm. And we're not, we're not standing behind you to hold you up because we think you're weak or unable, but because, hey, it's a thing. Mm. So I really appreciated that too, because that's a mark of a good instructor as well is you're not going to condescend to anybody. We had somebody in there, it was their first formal class ever. So there was a couple of things that, you know, there were learning curves for him, Jeremiah. Um, there were learning curves for him and they just worked with him. And it was never a, a sense of, you should know this already because you should know, be, you know, be a part of the training community, have experience training. It's just, okay, we'll work through that. Now you know. So it was never mean-spirited. It was just, now you know. Now we're going to play with this. Hey, this doesn't work for you. Try this. Mm. That and was if you feel a little extra support, that's okay. That was the extra support, like with Tuna, who's on your shoulder now. Yes. For the people that are listening to this on podcast, uh, Annette's cat's name's Tuna. I want to. I keep wanting to call her Noodle. I don't know why. <laughs> weird. Um, and it's on her. She's on her shoulder. So just wanted you to know. Um, so I want to talk about something too because this was pretty earth shattering and mind blowing and game changing for me. Was actually not the class. It was the class. The other class before the class, which was Friday night, um, and this is another thing of like, these guys, it's abundantly clear and it's clearly true that they really like teaching. They really like teaching. How can I, why would I say that? Because uh, Ashton said like, hey, you know, Friday night, actually I heard it through Tom Kelly, but essentially Ashton said that since everyone's going to be in town, uh, whoever's going to be in town, why don't we meet up at the range um, Friday night, the night before class, or Friday evening, you know, and shoot some pistol. Like, they didn't ask for money. There was, no, there was no add-on, you know, it wasn't like for $150 or something. So we showed up for, to shoot pistol. And it was going to be a, a block on recoil mitigation and, and muzzle rise mitigation. And I was just like, I've got the pistol for that. <laughs> So I brought currently in that uh, six hour P226 single action only um, Legion, whatever. And for whatever region, uh, for whatever region, for whatever reason, SIGs, when I start shooting really fast, my muzzle rise mitigate, the gun does not track. The gun does not return to where I want it. Um, and I just can't shoot it as fast as anything else. So I was like, oh my, because I can like white knuckle a Glock and be fine. So we went to the range on Friday night, and I will tell you, I learned more in this probably two and a half hour, three hour max. I don't even Not think, even. Yeah, because a lot of it was bullshit. You know what I mean? Some of it was just shooting at the end too. Mm -hmm. And I relearned how to grip a pistol. Yeah, I relearned how to grip a pistol. Think For about somebody that. who's been shooting as long and as much as you do at a very high level. You went way back to a fundamental. They had thoughts about a fundamental that we, I know you certainly thought that you knew. Um, it's something that I've thought about a lot. And most people who see me shoot would say I have pretty decent recoil management on my own, including with six, including with two, two sixes. But even so, they had a way of describing how it worked in the, that was just more useful than almost anybody else's articulation that I've heard. Yeah. And to go with it, Ashton and Tim, but especially Ashton, are some of the best coaches I've ever seen on the line in terms of looking at what you're doing mm -hmm. and how to make that little tiny tweak to make everything fall into place. I already told Ashton I'm going back out there to shoot with him at some point. Just me and him are going to go to the range for a day and figure some stuff out. And I don't go to very many people for pistol anymore. Uh, you, you're going to go back out to Ashton? Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was super impressed. And you know what? What they taught me worked. Like, mm -hmm. it worked. And, you know, they had a couple of actually extremely bone simple demos that you do with the person, which I'm not going to tell you. You got to take a class. Uh, because they, they, uh, Ashton teaches pistol classes. Um, and so I was like, okay, you've got my attention. 
because that what you did is you, you did the thing you wanted to do. And, uh, and yeah, you know, I, I grip the pistol differently now. I shoot the pistol a little bit differently now. And that's really saying something because I have a lot of rounds down range and I've been in a lot of classes for over many, many, many years. And like, I, I agree. I think that the way they describe how to grip a pistol is uh, better than anyone else that I've come across. Yeah. And I, I nerd out on things like pistol grip. So to say that oh, yeah. is big. Um, what, one of the things that I think related to that is there was a moment when I was in that session going, I need to have a little faith. I need to just do the thing that they're telling me to do without any of my input from my prior history and knowledge. Just have faith and do what the instructor says. And I think that's something that's really important to do as a student, no matter what class you're taking, is you're paying all this money and putting all this effort into taking a class, do what they tell you to do. You might think it's silly. You might think this is brilliant and I don't know how to make it work, so I'm gonna just revert to what I already know. Whatever it is, just do what they say because you might discover some really good new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, apps are friggin' lootly. And I've actually been in classes even recently where literally none of the techniques that were shown to me worked. And, I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do them, they didn't work for me, but I still worked as damn hard as I could. And that's not, a, a knock on the instructor. That's, that's a, I, we shoot differently, you know, but I, I worked my ass off in the class really tr and, and removing ego, you know, like just, because I'm, like, I'm like, it's not about even how good I do. It's about me trying to do it their way because I might come onto something that I'm like, Oh my God, that's mm -hmm. just phenomenal. So when you're it in might class, be for you, uh Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say it might be for you, but for any of you who think you're going to be instructors, it might be something that works for your students in a way that you just can't, because it doesn't work for you, you would never know about it unless you tried it from somewhere else. Mm. It's a good faith try. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, Scott. Scott Phillips says, no nightstand gun picture, then it really didn't happen. Gasp. <laughs> um, so other things that I wanted to talk about. So the weather, uh, it was hot on Saturday, it was extremely hot and extremely muggy on Sunday. And um, one of the things that we kind of had to ramp down on Sunday because of the heat. And we had two pop-up tents. Um, the range was kind of austere, but I don't care. We, nobody cares about austere as long as you have what you need. You need a portal body, you know, um, you know, yeah. you need pop-up tents. Yeah, it was totally fine. You, you know, we had pop-up tents. We had uh, lots and lots of, of, of liquids to drink and stuff. Um, so we got, we lucked out with, with the weather ex aside from the heat. And, you know, with that comes a, an instructor decision. Uh, and this is something that I talk kind of a bunch about with, especially with Ashton, mostly because Tim day two Day one had like was sick on Saturday, and day two had like a fever and lost his voice, but still taught. Yes, which was dedication. Still taught. Yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty amazing. Um, but uh, you know, Ashton had wanted to. He was like, "Man, you know, I, I just I made like an executive decision. Like these guys are. If they, if I work them as hard as I worked you guys the day on Saturday, like you're not gonna last." And I completely agree with him. One, and two, I have said on the show before, and I'm a big proponent of working when fatigued, but not when you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Because when, I, and this is my personal opinion, when we're exhausted, you're no longer aware entirely of what you're doing. You have less proprioception and awareness of what you, where your body is in space time, you know, the space time continuum or whatever. And, uh, and that's when like real bad things happen. If you're fatigued, I like that. That's like almost like twilight, like, work through that and focus, you know, and that's when you kind of be the cheerleader and have people focus. But there, by the end of day two, even at the kind of, not s slower, but more spaced out pace. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that would be slower ultimately, but it's more spaced out pace that uh, people were, people were done. People were yeah. done, you know? Um, and, and so that I think is a really smart 
And uh, you know, a, a, cr a credit and kudos to uh, both Tim and Ash because they recognized that rather than being like, oh, you know, if they don't fire like 500 shells a bird, you know, they're gonna be like, you know, this sucks. So we're gonna push them. They're not idiots, like they, you know what I mean. And they've been students enough that they can understand that dynamic. So. Yep. And it was good because there were enough students in the class, you know, you kind of went down the all-star list earlier. Um, all of us would have done whatever they asked, even, yeah. if, and all of us would have pushed. So they held us back. And I think that that was very smart and probably difficult to do because we were all like, yeah, we could totally do this. Let's shoot some more. We can do this. This isn't going to be a problem. But they kept a really good control of the class. And there was another um, a large, not a large number, but probably about another half of the class that were people who were, you know, local training junkies or first timers in class. So, you know, there's something to be said for balance in the class, not just for the training junkies who are out there all the time. Right. I've, I've trained well over 200 hours this year. At this point, I'm like, I don't care about the weather. I don't care about how tired I am. I'm just going to do that thing you tell me to do. <laughs> that's not true for everybody in the class. And it's really important for the instructor to be able to balance for the entire range of students, not just, you know, the gung ho person who's ready to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And then there were a bunch of very unique drills. Like we were able to uh, simulate. And again, this is available on my, uh, actually one of the things that's available on my Instagram video is me missing <laughs> yeah and uh then getting fudded so in order if you want to see me wear the fud hat then uh you can go onto my instagram and check out that video it's, it's pretty freaking funny i actually didn't post me i got a redo after everybody had gone and i i hit it the second time and then but there were a lot of expletives and i was like i'm trying to get a job <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to show that on the internet um, it's bad enough that you have to talk about hunting rabbits yeah, I do. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, so let's see other things. Other things in the class that you want to talk about? Oh well, the lunches were quote unquote working lunches, which it was funny because Ashton every time we walked over, he's like, "Okay, we're gonna have a work. Let's do a lunch. It's gonna be a working lunch." As in, uh, we work and you eat, which is exactly what they were because they were talking the entire time, and it was kind of. You, you and I talked about this and that on the ride home is that like, because I, I actually was thinking maybe they should just let people totally relax during lunch. And then you had a really good point. You said, well, the conversation is light enough it, that you can passively listen and still get a bunch and not have to fully invest on the listening component. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So they use the lunch for some of the lecture pieces instead of, you know, putting it all together on day one morning, like a lot of classes do. And it was a nice way to break up the day. Uh, a lot of it was the kind of topic that you would probably talk about during your lunch break anyway. So that was really nice. And the other thing I like about it from an instructor perspective is sometimes when you take a true lunch break, getting everyone back in the mindset is really hard. Yeah. So having a working lunch kind of continues the pace of the class. It slows it down, it pulls it back. But then when we're ready to get back out on the range, People still are like, hey, I'm in class, not I took a break and now I have to come back. Maybe I'm a little tired. Maybe I'm a little distracted. I've forgotten things. So that worked out really well and also gave us an opportunity to hear some really unique things that I don't think they would have been able to cram yeah. into the class otherwise. Yeah, there wouldn't have been, there, it wouldn't have been, there, there was more important stuff to do mm -hmm. while, we had, while we were like present and having shotguns on us. You right. Know? Uh, so the people are going to wonder, like, what, what do we talk about? The first day we talked about uh, slugs and load selection. Mm -hmm. uh, it was mostly on slugs and kind of where they fall into place. And, like, you know, depending on what your um, – I was about to say – it's actually, I sound really cool when I say this. Area of operations. Thank you very much. I feel so cool right now. No, but where you – Operate tar. Yeah, where, where you live, where you work. You know what I mean? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe your gun is loaded all with slugs. Maybe it's loaded all with buckshot, you know? Uh, so it, the cool thing about the shotgun is that you can really customize it via just the load selection for like the environment that you're in, you know? And then, and then day two we talked about, which 
my God, I mean, Ashton's a funny dude and pretty smart about guns. I didn't know he was like actually smart. He's like a fucking engineer. He's talking about, so we talked about lubrication. And I was like, we're going to talk about lube during lunch. Okay. And I was like, oh my God, he really knows about like oils and stuff. I was like cracking up on the inside. I'm like, shit. I, you know, I thought we were just going to talk about, you know, hit the friction points and call it a day. But he, the depth of knowledge that he has, like he was using all sorts of cool words that were big and stuff. That, <laughs> and it's not the point that I can't remember them so that it's like, well, why use them? It's like, no, it, they made sense at the time, you know, um, but he was he talking. understands about, what he's talking about. He understands what he's talking about. And he had very interesting uh, thoughts about grease versus oil, oil versus grease. So yeah, I mean, it, it gave me, it, I'll tell you, like I'm certain things I'm pretty much, okay, like this is the way I do it, you know? Uh, but he gave me some shit to think about this, that, that, that weekend from the pistol, which I've changed now, I'm, I bought that, uh, to like lubrication that I'm like, that's really interesting, you know? Um, so that was kind of cool. And that's just the lunch break, you know? Um, One of the things I super appreciate about the lunch breaks and all the other breaks, they use their breaks in general to teach the lecture portions. So there's very little time of like, we're just going to sit and do absolutely nothing class related. It's we're going to sit down. And if you, we got breaks of students from all this, like on relays. So one relay shooting, the other relays kind of sitting and relaxing. But when the entire class was off the line and we had a little break to move on or because the AIs were doing a fantastic job of redoing the range for the next set of drills, we talked about other things. Um, but one of the things I really appreciated was Tim and Ash have a great depth of knowledge about this topic. They nerd out about it. It's very clear. But then they turned to other people in the class that they knew really knew certain topics and asked them to talk about it as well. And I found that really it's a lack of ego there when you're teaching the class and you turn to a student or you turn to an A and say, hey, you're actually the expert on this. Can you tell us? Mm -hmm. So we got to hear a little bit from Rob Hott, who has had such an influence on LE use of shotguns in the U.S. We got to hear a little bit from Eric Stern, who, among other things, manages the shotgun program, manages the 1301 for Beretta. So we got to pick his brains a little bit about the shotguns, and Beretta very generously provided a number of 1301s for us to shoot during the class if we wanted to, which I thought was fantastic. Mm. you know, getting that kind of industry support. And then Eric went and took the class with us, which yeah. is cool. Um, and, and it was the same thing. Like there was an AI who was uh, a uh, law enforcement officer. So they asked him to speak a little bit as to ammo selection for his job and what worked and didn't work. There were students in the class who were Ellie. And it was the same sort of thing. Like, you tell us about your experiences because they're important and they're valid in the entire class from them. And we have no problem with the fact that we are not the biggest experts in here. Sometimes our students are the actual experts. Yeah. Very, very good point. And that actually brings me up to something that I'm so glad you said that because I, a note on Eric Stern, um, it was like instant best friend kind of thing for me. You know, um, but yeah, Eric. he was such a cool cat. The dude can actually out, he can overrun a trigger in a shotgun. Because he's, I mean, dude, his hand must be just like a thousand percent fast twitch muscles. I mean, it sounds like a, it sounds like a machine gun fire. It's like, I'm like, and he doesn't move. It's really cool. But watching him fire the 1301. Um, the, the reason that I, I wanted to talk about him is one, he came and he brought product and that was really cool. And I was totally expecting it to be, you know, these are Beretta products him do maybe a five minute spiel and then sit down and do work emails and insturbate, you know, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, did I just make that up. I think I did. Yeah, uh, I think you did. That's, that's actually a pretty good word too. It's pretty, yeah, it's good. pretty accurate. Right. Uh, and, and, and just like kind of be away from us. And if somebody wants to shotgun, he, yeah, this is how you do it. And like kind of give us the sales pitch and kind of give us exactly. And he did it. There was no like, no. you should buy a 1301 from Eric. That was from everybody else in the class of the 1301. <laughs> yeah, so there wasn't a sales pitch and, and he did not. He, he was a student in that class. He was on the line. He was in relay, uh, I think two or whatever. It was my relay or whatever. 
Uh, and he took the whole class, you know, didn't bitch, didn't complain, wasn't on his phone the whole time. And for me, you know, kind of having seen many different sides of this industry at this point, um, that means a lot because that means he gives a shit. He really I mean, cares, you know. He knows the product from the point of view of a shooter. Yes. Not just from somebody who wants to sell guns, but from somebody who shoots these guns and watches people and talks to people who actually shoot these guns for the things that we actually want. I mean, sort of famously on the Beretta 1301 Comp, which is the competition model 1301, and I believe they did this on the TAC as well because you might as well, uh, they moved the serial number placement for across generations of the gun because in three gun, we like to hog out the loading port, make it bigger and wider, kind of like you did on your Benelli, so it's easier to load. And the original serial number placement was really close to the loading port. And he heard and got Beretta to listen to, hey, maybe we should move the serial number so people can do more of that. Yeah. That takes a product manager who cares about the product and cares about the people who are actually shooting the product. Yeah. He didn't need to sell those guns because we were all doing it for him. All he had to do was bring more of them so that everybody who wanted to try one could, or everyone who wanted to try <laughs> one could. Oh, what happens if I put a dot on this gun because my 1301 doesn't have one yet? Mm. And, right. you know, it wasn't just Eric who brought extra guns. Uh, Tim and Ash have an enormous collection of shotguns. And that was something that I found super useful about this class because setting up a shotgun is so individual and so personal was you get the opportunity to try, if you want to, a whole lot of guns with a whole lot of setups to see if they work for you or not. You know, this is where I learned as a left-handed shotgun shooter that putting uh, shot shells on the left side of the receiver where they belong doesn't work really well. And it just spent a lot of money to do that. I picked up a gun, shot a couple of rounds through it and went, this isn't going to work. I also fell in love with putting a dot in the shotgun, and that's being arranged now. <laughs> I almost, uh, you are, mu I'm not muted now. Why are you telling me that I'm, I'm not muted? No, you're not muted. Weird. Um, yes, and uh, so uh, in a word, too, on the 1301, there were a bunch of people running a 1301 in the class. Um, I only, sh I really wanted to run my Benelli because this was like a test of the gun, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I ran one drill with the 1301, a total of eight shells. And I was like, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's happening. And I can't wait to really get my hands on one and, uh, and run it, you know, hard. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, our, our friend, Adam Roth of Aridus Industries, he makes a bunch of awesome aftermarket parts for it. Uh, that are actually in the Beretta catalog now. So when you go online to Beretta.com or Beretta USA or whatever it is, uh, and you go to the accessories, uh, Eridus Industry, the Crom, which is a mount that mounts the receiver that allows you to do an RMR or a red dot, um, as well as his uh, quick detach um, side saddle, uh, his Magpul uh, SGA stock adapter, as well as a Magpul forehand adapter. Like that's all on all that stuff's on Beretta, which I think is like such a huge win because I saw like the earliest prototypes of his stuff. And now he, I mean, he's really, I'll tell you, like a, a really exceptional product will rise as long as you do. I, I'm, yeah. I'm really excited because I got to shoot a 1301 with the SGA sock on it all weekend using Adam's product. And I had known that I was shooting shotguns that were too big for me. It's actually kind of hard to find a shotgun that fits me. I finally shot a shotgun that almost fit me. That almost fit you. Right. Almost. I, it, there's a few other things that we need to do to the SGA stock to really make it work for me. Mm. But, you know, without the work that Adam's done that's valuable from Eridus, you're just never going to get a shotgun that's short enough like the bull. Yeah. Not for, for smaller people. Um, the 1301 just doesn't, as far as I know, there's not a youth stock for it or a women's stock for it. So this is what you have to do. Well, um, that brings me to one of our, our Patreon questions from Scott. And since he's in chat, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it is, what should, the, what should be the proper length of pull for a shotgun? Do you want to hit this or you want to hit it first? Um, my answer is probably going to be the least useful one, which is short. 
I think that you can't go too short on like the full on shotgun, especially with the way that we learn how to shoot them. Yeah, I think that there is a point of too short, but that's not anything that you're going to see. Typically, you know, you've got like a traditional 13.5 inch or longer, you know, like this Benelli, where's my tape measure? It's, oh, it's, it's over there. Damn it. I want to measure how long this length of pull is because it's got to be, you know what? Wait one. Uh, just talk about something. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> well, one of the things that we found with the 1301s in class, a lot of them had the Magpul SGA stock on them with the Aridus adapter. And that brings the length of pull down to, I want to say like 12 and a half, 13, something like that, which is rel considered relatively short. And nobody found that too short in class. And that should be a clue that, you know, we all went to a fairly short, the sh almost the shortest available commercial stock, and it was still long enough for everybody. So I think you're going to find it very difficult to go too short unless you have, you know, super monkey arms, super weird anatomy, physiology. But we had a pretty wide range of folks in class, and they were all able to run that short stock, I think. Yeah, this, this, this shotgun is almost 14 and a half inch length. And it's just too damn long. Like it because so why 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 does this make a difference? Because if you think about unless you're super 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 tall and really 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 lanky, at a certain point it's it it becomes impossible to fully square up. You can still have your hips square, but your your upper body will start to blade, which is mm -hmm. essentially bad. You know. Um, because the more squared up that you are, the more that the gun can stay in a natural point of equilibrium in the center line up towards your body, the better you can yeah. control it. It's, I mean, it's physics and stuff. Um, Plus push-pull works better with a shorter stock. Definitely. So this stock, I was, I believe, kind of at the limit of what I could do with this length of pull. And the only reason I say that is because a couple of other people, including... I think Tim, Tim or Ash, and, and and one or two of the students said, like, yeah, you're kind of you're kind of limited at this point with how much you're going to be able to control that because it's blading you. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, the length of pulls is fucking too long. But I think that a you know the youth stocks, which are like twelve and a half inch, uh, and then the Hogue, I think, makes a twelve inch or twelve or twelve and a half inch. I think that's a that's that's a short stock that's that's a really decent length that allows you to really square up. Um, and, and get get hard on the gun. But um, I would say at most, maybe 13, you know. I would think you need real monkey arms to make that work. Well, I mean, I was making this work, but it, like the way that you measure length of pull, because I did this as a gunsmith when we're doing stocks, is you go to the crook of your elbow and to your uh, middle of your finger. So this is 13 inches, right? You see how I'm doing that with my finger extended? Um, and, or, but if I bend it, it's like 12 and a half. So that's like general length of pull, but you know what? That's like for trap and skeet. And this is like not trap and skeet where in trap and skeet, I really don't care if I'm kind of bladed, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm like carrying, you know, what we're trying to go for birds and stuff that doesn't, that doesn't scare me. And you're also firing bird loads, you know, game loads and yeah. stuff. Like, it's not a big deal. <sighs> and I've run, you know, these super long socks. I, you know, I have a, a uh, Benelli M2 that I run with a standard length sock, then I can make it work. You know, I shot Rob Hawk's two-day class with that gun. It's doable. But, you know, over the, this weekend for this class, that, that's when they put me in a 1301 with that SGA stock. It's a lot shorter. And a lot suddenly, better, huh? Every, suddenly, everything was a lot easier to shoot. And once we get something even shorter than that for me, I think we're going to take off the butt pad and replace it with something even shorter to give me another, you know, half inch, three quarter of an inch. It's probably going to be downright enjoyable to shoot. Yeah. Because that's the other thing. When you square up, the recoil is going to feel a little bit less than when you're kind of off at that angle. And yeah. it's you around. Yeah, exactly. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Scott, um, let's see. Uh, slam. Uh, swings on shotguns for house guns. Um, I'm going to go with no, but I have one on mine because it doesn't have QDs. And I'm like, fuck it. But typically, I, I, I don't think you need to run a sling on a, on a house gun for home defense. 
thing. I'm anyway. not planning on putting one on my on my house gun. Yeah. You know, this slings can are really easy to get caught up. Yes. And tangled and things like that get in the way of all sorts of things. There's no way you really use a sling on a shotgun like you might on a rifle as a hasty sling for support if you need to make a longer shot. Um, th there's really nothing to gain from it except for potentially the ability to, you know, go hands-free and keep the gun with you. Right. I would argue that if that's something that you need for your home defense plan, then shotgun might not be the way for you to go anyway. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, but I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eventually, that's like the next port part of what I'm gonna do with this shotgun is put QDs on it so I can rip the sling off easily. Well, having a, you know, unwind it through these buckles. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Opinions on buckshot and using chokes to get optimal patterning or just finding a good patterning load and sticking with it. Well, uh, that depends on if your gun accepts chokes, uh, one. And two, uh, I mean, that's a bit, I mean, for, for, for what? Like, are we talking about like hunting? We're talking about home defense because most home defense guns are not going to have chokes. Like 1301, I believe now does come with chokes. Even the shorter one, the 18 and a half or uh, inch barrel has chokes. Um, I would say that with the advent of and the availability now of flight control, that's a pretty easy way of getting around just having a cylinder bore improved. You know, I think what you got to do is if your gun accepts chokes, you got to go get some of that ammo that you want to use. And if you're not sure what you want to use, you got to get some of everything. Go out and shoot it. You got to pattern your gun. And you are going to pattern, if your gun accepts chokes, you're going to be patterning it with and without chokes to see what's giving you the best pattern for your use. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, th and that, I, I, sh I should have prefaced it with saying that you need to pattern it, you know, like if somebody says, Hey man, Oh, you got a, you know, a modified, I'm just, I don't know, a modified choke in there. Yeah. Take this. These work good. That's not the way this works. It's not, it's not a rifle barrel. It's a bored out hole with no rifling the variances and, and the dimensions uh, of the uh, inner diameter of the bores are, are very greatly. And you need, I could take, a Benelli off the assembly line next to under, next to the consecutive serial number Benelli in an, on the assembly line, and it patterns two loads differently or the same load differently. You know, mm -hmm. so it is absolutely about patterning that gun. Um, one of the things that I found that I, that I I don't know how I didn't really like see this. Before. Maybe I was so impressed with the little ragged rat hole thing that I just didn't really notice or, or, or care about the flying pellet, but the nine pellet flight control usually has, or is more likely at the very least of having one flyer. Mm -hmm. And I found that very interesting. And it's a way that they sit inside, you know, uh, three, 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 as opposed to, I'm not going to try to do math like right here, but three, two, three or whatever. Um, it just, the, the way that it comes down the barrel and out and, and, and impacts down range is a little bit different where the eight pellet stays together better than the nine pellet, which has typically one flyer. And it was, I shot the other day, I actually took a picture of the thing, which I didn't post on Instagram. I take more pictures for Instagram than don't post them. I'm like, great, great, great business model. Cool. That's what th Throwback Thursday is for. Oh, all right. Is that what TB, that's what TBT is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so. It's amazing that, you, you know, the, that the eight round, but here's the thing. We also witnessed some guns in class shoot absolute dog shit buckshot with beautiful patterns. Mm-hmm. And not yeah. with like a bang barrel, you know, a nope. bang barrel, which is a barrel that, um, bang comp will modify to make work better with certain loads not with chokes or anything that gun just happened to like that ammo and it was producing patterns that were as good as flight control yeah it happens you just won't know until you shoot it yeah so it's an excuse to shoot so that's what you should do yeah <laughs> 
Uh, so maybe you can answer this because my exposure uh, to, on the or experience on the 1301 is kind of minimal, but I, I would assume that it's just about the same with the Benelli. Ghost loading a 1301 is difficult for me anyways. Is there an easy way to do it? Mine always wants to chamber the shell and lifter never, and the lifter never stays down when I try to let the bolt forward slowly. I usually let my bolt forward some and then push it down and then put the shell in and then feed one of the tube or feed one of the, in the chamber. It's, it's kind of a little shitty thing. Show ghost loading on all guns, uh, on all shotguns that I've ever played with, and it's not something I've played with a whole lot, to be honest. It, it's at a certain point here. This is where I'm going to get my plug in. Watch, you got to get some dummy shells and play with it and practice it in dry fire. So that's the way to make it easier is to just do it more. Do you know anybody that may have a book on dry fire that would be extremely helpful for? both beginners and experienced shooters? I, I've heard that this Annette Evans chick has this book called The Dry Fire Primer that might talk a little bit about this. Huh, that's fucking weird. So like, hold on. You mean like, like this? Yeah, that looks familiar. That's really <laughs> weird. Gosh, and this one was oh. even, even signed. Jeff, that, I can't say that. Well, those are like, I'm kidding. <laughs> It was sexual in nature. I'm kidding. It was like <laughs> but that's something about all all manipulations. So ghost loading, the reason it's tricky is it's a tricky manipulation of a gun. Just kind of like uh, loading a shotgun with quad loads, like you would in competition, for instance. And the best way to do it is go get dummy rounds. Um, I like to use the ones from Brownells. There's a whole bunch of other ones on the market, and play with it. And you'll eventually discover the trick that makes it work. And if you do it enough times, it will not be tricky anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I feel like shotguns are, if there's one gun to have dummy rounds for, it's a shotgun. Because mm -hmm. it's so such a manipulation-heavy gun, unlike, you know, again, it's, excuse me, it's a lot less of put the thing in the thing and pull the thing. It's more like... <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> right, something like that. Um, or he. he. Um, so here we go. Any drills specifically for shotguns when it comes to reloads and what a good time is? Wow, there's so much variation in that. So the drills are literally to reload the gun. So shoot one, reload one. Uh, shoot one, reload one with another an extra round in the tube so you have to go through the loading port. There's... You can shoot something like the casino drill where you're shoot, starting with five rounds of the gun and you're shooting one round at tar a target one, two rounds at target two, and you have to reload the gun. Um, in terms of times that are good, that has so many variables. Where are you loading from? Are you loading from a pouch where shells are in every which direction? Are you loading from a side saddle? Are you loading from a, uh, a three by three or four by four carrier on your belt? Are you loading with twin loads? Uh, quad loads, whatever from competition, are you loading strong hand, weak hand? I would say that instead of being concerned about what is a good time, objectively, is figure out the time it takes you to do that and make it better. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, and you know what, I think that your answer too about the casino drill, let's just lay this out. I just, just Google casino shotgun drill or casino pistol drill or whatever. So it's one target. And on that, there are six shapes, each with a number uh, numbered one through six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right? You've got, you start with six shells in the gun. So five in the tube, one in the chamber. And then you go one, so it'll be bang, one, two, one, two, three, and then you're gonna have to start loading. So you have to, you port load, you load into the, the magazine. Uh, I, what I did, my thing is because I know I cannot count, like literally, I can't, I can't do it when I'm like doing stuff. Um, like when I'm doing push-ups, I'm like, what are we on? Is that 15? They're like, no, it's 35. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was in a different place. I was thinking about that uh, Beatrix and Midge video I saw with the tuxedo cat and the Bernese mountain dog. And they're so cute. I love them. Adorable, okay, yeah. guys, we're done push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I would just load the amount of shells that I need for the next object. So that way I didn't have to count. I knew that once I, once I went to lock, that was the amount of rounds in that target. And then I, it's just a great drill. 
and it's 21 yeah. rounds total. Uh, yeah, I'm saying you're doing it with slugs too, so you're working on recoil management. Uh, and you can you can use do it with anything really, but I like I really like the casino drill. Let me tell you, I mean this was day two that we did it, so you know you, your hands are kind of fatigued anyway. But towards the end, my they they weren't cramped, but they were like my support hand was like exhausted from loading. I loaded between every target on the casino drill, and uh, and I just threw threw four of the gun every time. But you can count it. But I can count. Yeah, that's not doesn't work for me. But that means I was working on a different loading skill than you were, because I wasn't loading to an empty. I didn't have to throw one in in the uh, port because I didn't load from empty. I always had a full gun except for the very last round because I miscounted. Mm -hmm. I just planned plan it wrong, and then I was also loading twins. Yeah. So you know the, our reload speeds are going to be different. Mm-hmm. I was going to make a math and uh, counting joke, but I'm not going to do it because I'm, that's beneath me. <laughs> you could all imagine it, pretend that he said it, and yes, <laughs> the joke was made in class. <laughs> but, you know, it was either the Asian jokes or the girl jokes. Right, true. Um, and the gay jokes, and those are my favorite because I love making fun of gays. Okay. Um, any of uh, those are. <laughs> Those are all of our questions from our Patreon supporters. Um, let's see, any things, anything that you want to wrap up with or last thoughts um, about the, the class or who should take this class? I mean, given, yeah, any, any, any thoughts really? I think my last thought for this class is I kind of took this on a whim. I don't really like shotguns be honest about it but i think it's important to go train in things that you don't necessarily like and things that you aren't good at get out of your comfort zone that way uh, among other things you're going to learn a skill that you might need you might discover you like it more than you thought you did i mean i certainly like shotguns better now than i did two months ago I'm still you know a little uncertain about them but the best way to get more comfortable with them is to go force yourself to spend time with them I think it's important to go do that thing that you're not really certain about. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to learn. Just go out and do it. You know, a class like this is really challenging. Even on paper, it looks like a, a hard class, and it is. But that doesn't mean you can't do it, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means go out, put your heart into it, and do the best you can, and you know, go be uncomfortable. Mm. Good. I dig it. And, and yeah, Tim Chandler's company is Justified Defensive Concepts. Um, I'm really kind of embarrassed that I didn't, didn't have that written down. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that, that this was one of the best classes that I've taken. Uh, it was an absolute hoot. It was filled with great people. The, both Tim and Ashton were, uh, exceptionally knowledgeable. Um, I had a, a, a blast, but I also, from a student perspective, it was as good a class as I can remember taking the way that the, the points of instruction were, were laid out, the way that things were explained. Um, I want to, I mean, I, I, I'm glad, I knew it was going to be good. Um, even with my high expectations, I was pleasantly surprised. And mm -hmm. One of my things is uh, I really love exposing our viewership um, and our, our viewers and, and listeners to, in my opinion, exceptional trainers. And uh, I'll tell you right now at, the, at this moment in time, uh, Tim Chandler, Ashton Ray, and John Murphy are the guys that, that I want to I just expose the shit out of because I want people to train with these guys. They're phenomenal instructors. Uh, they really, really care. And, yeah. and that, that means a lot to me because you know what, even the, even sometimes when you get a good teacher and you, and you think you like, they don't really want to be here. They're, they're kind of burnt. I'm like, it's just a little sad, you know, like you can still have a good learning experience, but that ain't these guys. Like I'll tell you, Ashton is hungry to teach. Like he, 
you know how some teachers say, feel free to reach out with, to, with, to uh, me with questions after class? Mm -hmm. These guys really mean it. Yes. Very good way of putting it. So um, I can recommend this class without hesitation. Um, if you have Same. questions, you know, it, 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 any of his classes, especially considering that in uh, probably two and a half hours, I have learned how to grip a pistol better. Um, and pistol is kind of my thing. Like that's what I shoot the most. That's really saying something. So, uh, so yeah. So recommend it without reservation. Agreed. Cool. So, well, we really want your feedback here at Practically Tactical. So please send any compliments, feedback, guest suggestions to Nick at practicallytactical.com. We want to thank our amazing Patreon supporters like Scott Phillips, Tactical Fedora, um, who help us do our shows and help turn gun owners into responsibly armed citizens. We can't thank you guys enough. If you like our shows and our content, please check us out on our website or visit patreon.com forward slash practically tactical. We also want to thank our amazing sponsors, Big Techs Outdoors, Shot Stop Ballistics, and Phoenix Ammo. Please visit practicallytactical.com. I almost said that like in a southern accent, practicallytactical.com uh, for more information on sponsors. <laughs> this is so much more fun when the other guys are here, with Jesse and Nick are here to ruin everything. Uh, on sponsors for links and discount codes. Well, I feel like this is where the background music comes in. Well, as always, guys and gals, thank you for tuning in and listening to us as we greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Practically Tactical. Mm, hold on, let's see. So we're still recording. If yes, you receive an email notification by cloud recording. Oh, yeah.